I was on the edge with anger, right? I was, I was angry with, with um, everybody, you know, with my family for no reason, you know, with God, with, with however I wound up like this, you know, every day I would, even though I was, I consider myself an atheist, I, I, well, God, why are you doing this to me? Why is this happening to me? Right. I'm, I'm 45 years old, you know, why is this happening? Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Altick, and I'm a chaplain with the police department. The Hey Chaplain podcast is the place where members of the law enforcement community share their wisdom and experience through me, the chaplain, so that they can encourage others who wear the badge. On Hey Chaplain, you'll hear from dispatchers and federal agents, sheriffs and U.S. Marshals, as well as local detectives and patrolmen in my hometown of Kansas City. From the LAPD to Scotland Yard, the guests on Hey Chaplain deliver advice and insights so that police officers everywhere can survive and thrive. Today we pick up with part two of my interview with former police officer Norm Welsh. We'll look at the results of Norm's downward spiral caused by his post-traumatic stress injury, failing health, prescription med addiction, and a slippery slope of bad moral decisions. We'll also discuss his crime and his incarceration, and we'll look at his remarkable journey from prison to what he's doing now. Make sure you don't miss our discussion of what the next chapter looks like when you've already committed your life to helping others. But first, we'll pick up the conversation with Norm's decision to commit a crime. Here's Norm Welsh. We'll talk about that just briefly. So you're having these destructive behaviors, these self-destructive feelings, and, and you know the messages going through your mind are, are pretty negative and pretty hopeless. But you're still working and and you're you know a commander in a narcotics unit and that kind of thing what was your crime how did you go from enforcing the law to committing a crime well i i didn't think about it at the time but i've been committing little crimes all along the way right like uh, mm. ethical violations right so the, this this guy i used to work with in in my first city he became a private eye and he would call me every once in a while and say, hey, you know, I got, um, I got a license plate. Can you run this license plate? Can you give me a DMV picture of, of this person I got surveillance on? You know, and then he became an informant, actually, and actually did a couple cases for the, for the task force. You know, so it, I, I don't know if your viewers all know, but in California, it's illegal to use the computer system for, um, for, for any non-police business or need, kind of need-to-know things. Right. And so I'd already been doing that. Right. Yeah. And little when, little um, ethical violations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was trying to set me up with a couple of girls to, to, to be with a couple of girls. I didn't know. Well, I still don't know, but I, I believe that he was trying to benefit from my mental illness, I guess, but I can't prove that. And I'm not going to accuse him of that, but right. And so at one point he says, Hey, you know, um, what are you doing? You know? And I um, said, so yeah, we just see some marijuana from, um, a UPS store because we did a lot of interdiction there. Okay. And he goes, well, you know, what's, what's going to happen? I said, well, we're just going to have it destroyed. A week later, he basically calls and says, Hey, um, I need that weed. I, I, I could sell that weed. And I just laughed at him at first. And, and then he goes, Hey, you know, you don't want your department to find out about all this stuff with these girls and, um, in the, in the computer stuff, do you? And oh, wow. uh, right there, and right there, you know, and I'm not, I, I'm not trying to, to belittle my involvement in it in any way. So these were my decisions that I made, and I believe that now looking back, if I would have went to my department and said, hey, I got myself in a pickle, I, I, I ran these people out, and um, I, I gave him registration stuff, I truly believe that due to my good reputation that I probably maybe would have got some time off without pay, but I wouldn't have been fired, and I wouldn't have went to prison yeah. for sure. Yeah. You know. So, But we all think that we're smarter than the system, right? So you know, I, I can get away with it and, and I can deal with this guy, you know, and my old, the old norm from 20 years ago would have been, I'm, I'm just going to beat the crap out of this guy, you know, get rid of him, <laughs> you know, but, 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 you know, when you're not in your right mind from both the, 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 the narcotics and the mental illness, mm -hmm. you, you make the worst decisions and you somehow you justify it, Right. I mean, I'm an addiction counselor right now, and I get these guys that do this criminal behavior, rob people and stuff, and, and burglarize houses, but they justify it. They justify it based on, on their, their um, addiction, and um, a lot of these guys are mentally ill. Yeah. 
So, so I ended up do, doing that. And then he called me back a couple months later and now he want, he needed some meth. And so he told me he had a, a buyer to, um, to buy this meth and he would be good. And, um, and, and no more problems that after that, that this, this would be done. And, you know, I had already done, done the marijuana and I thought to myself, you know, I just want to get, get this over with and get done. I was in a self-destructive mood. Again, I'm not trying to make any excuses. I, this is the decisions that I made. But that's an accurate description of how you were thinking at the time. Right, right. as I was thinking at the time. Now I look back and I go, wow, how, how could you do that? You spend your whole life on the opposite side, and now you're, you're committing these acts. And so I, I did it. I, I took um, uh, a pound of methamphetamine out of evidence that was going to be destroyed, so this didn't affect anybody else's cases. Um, it, it was going to be destroyed. And I gave it to him, and uh, Dude, this is how good of a drug dealer I am that he gave it directly to an informant and I was arrested the next day. Oh, wow. So, so I, after 16 years of narcotics, I, I think if I really wanted to, I could be a better drug dealer. Than that. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I don't know. It, it, it's for the best, you know? I mean, it, it really is for the best. Even the time I spent in prison, yeah. I believe that if um, God came down and gave me a do-over and said, hey, listen, you know, we'll make this so you don't have to go to prison, I wouldn't have changed a thing because um, this experience um, it was not only humbling, but it changed my whole attitude. It yep. made me look at life different uh, perspective. It looked, made me look at people at a different perspective because like most cops, I'm not going to say all, but like most cops, we think it's us and them, right? And, right. And they're scumbags and we're, we're the heroes. But There's an empathy was, gap. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. And there's a reason why people do the things they do, right? I would have never thought that I would ever have done anything near this. And um, I realize how, how close everyone is to, to making that one mistake that'll, you know, that, that'll ruin them. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and a lot of officers don't realize that. A lot of the guys that I know that are alcoholics, you know, they're one, D, one DUI crash away from killing somebody. Yeah. And then, you know, maybe I'm not the biggest scumbag then. Maybe, you know, <laughs> somebody else is. But, uh, but, but that's, yeah, those, those were the crimes. And yeah. I was arrested. I bailed out. I spent two years out on bail, and I went to great psychiatrists and, and great psychologists that were ex-police officers that really knew the business. Saved my life, but it didn't heal, right? Yeah. I mean, I was still going through everything, although I felt better and I had better coping skills because the psychologist I had, Dr. Joel Fay, he, he taught me how to cope with things better. I could make it through the day without, without using any, any pills or alcohol or anything like that. So when I pled guilty, yeah, they took me into custody and they, they put me in a suicide cell for one year in the oh, wow. county jail in, in San Jose. And that was the worst, the worst I could ever, even my worst enemies, I, I, I wouldn't want to go through this. This hmm. is hor- horrific, right? It, it's just, but you know, God, God used that. Specifically the isolation? The isolation, you know, you're, yeah. you're all alone. You, you know, you get one, the one phone call. I was only able to go outside to shower or to go outside one hour every three days. Huh. And um, no, the lights are on 24-7. There's no blankets. You know, there's no pillow. Um, you're, you're basically on a yoga mat on a cement bed. But, but what, what a blessing out of it is not only did I have time to really study the Bible, but when they did let me out, they put me, it's, it's like two half-court basketball courts on the roof. And they're separated by chain link fences and, of course, chain link fence on, on the ceiling. But when they put me, because they had to segregate me all the time. So when they put me up there, they put me up there really with the worst of the mentally ill that, that I, I think they could house. Huh. And I started talking to these guys. And, you know, I didn't tell them who I was or anything, but I started talking to these guys. And I, I have a way of, of being easy to talk to, I'm told. And they huh. opened up about their 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 um, childhood and, and what they've been through and w- why they're here. And it whole gave me a whole new perspective on why people do the things they do. Right. We never learned that in the police Academy. Okay. Well, you know, if you, if you're um, raped by a, an uncle at the age of five, you know, you're going to turn out to, to be a drug addict. I mean, just I mean, almost a hundred percent of the time. Right. Yeah. So, but we don't learn that, right? So we see these drug addicts as, as criminals who steal from people, who rob people, you know, homeless people that, that are out just, just causing problems. We don't see that traumatized side of them. 
And, and that's what got me interested in trying to figure out, you know, how we can go about healing this. So not only healing yeah. them, but healing me too. Yeah. How much time total did you serve? Um, eight and a half years. Okay. I was curious. I've, I've heard you mention it before, but uh, uh, can you tell me about finding other cops who are incarcerated? You know, there was a lot more of them than I ever thought. I thought I was going to be the lone guy. <laughs> the only cop in prison? The, the, yeah. the only guy, yeah. You know, even in, in San Jose, in the next cell next to me was a San Jose cop who committed spousal abuse. Mm. And he was in there. He had a year sentence, so he had to do six months in, in the county jail. And I went to, they took me to Fort Worth, Texas. They wanted me to get out of California because of um, because of who I was. And and I, I went to the chapel, and there was like three cops working at the chapel, I met a couple of sheriffs um, from down south who were who were down there. Some really good people. Like one one guy was just a a, a real good guy who who I read his stuff and and you know I, I think that he got a bad deal, but you know yeah. everybody has to has a cross to bear. But but that's where I met. You know this is how God works in your life, right? They they sent me to to Fort Worth, Texas. I'm so mad. I'm so far away from the Bay Area, San Francisco. My family can't visit me, and um. I go to the chapel and all of a sudden there, Tyndale Seminary is coming in doing classes, right? So I start taking some classes. I ended up getting my master's degree in theology. Hmm. So one day the chaplain tells me that he wants me to meet somebody. So I go into the chaplain's office and he introduces me to this former Los Angeles Police Department officer, Ruben Palomares, who was one of the main guys of the Rampart scandal hmm. in the 90s. Yeah, And you would think wow, this guy's a real scumbag because what he was doing is he was um, robbing dope dealers, using other dope dealers to sell the dope, and he was actually even doing home invasion robberies and stuff under the guise of, of being a police officer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, huge huge thinking, scandal. Yeah, Huge, huge. And he got, uh, I think it was an 18-year sentence, and he had done like 14. And in the, in the feds, you do 80%. So when I finally started to talk to him, I was feeling better, right? Because I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm the worst scumbag here, you know, because I'm, you know, I, I stole dope and I, I gave it to somebody to sell. But then he starts telling me he legitimately had to shoot and kill three suspects at two separate times, right? One time he was getting robbed, he got shot. So they were legitimate um, shoots. They were quote unquote depart- good shoots. Good shoots uh, right. under, the, under the law, right? Right, right. And that was before he was still young at that time. He was still like in the 24, 25 um, age range because he looked so young. They put him in the school. But anyway, he told me what happened. He goes, the, 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 the department started giving him all these awards. They gave him the name, name of killer. And um, he was looked up to, right? So you, first of all, you have a moral injury of, of, uh, of killing somebody, right? Yeah. Even though it's justified. Killing some, I don't know one officer that has been like really good with killing somebody. I mean, legally, yes, but there's always some type of eternal, internal sadness, I guess. Oh, yes, yes. Um, for, for taking a life. And, and yes, it was necessary, but, but still we, we deal with that as human beings. So he started using marijuana and, you know, and, and every time he went somewhere, they'd pat him on the back, they'd buy him lunch and you know, so this is messing him up. And then all of a sudden he starts using cocaine and alcohol and that's how he got And, and these are, again, these are not, I'm not trying to make any excuses for him, you know, but then he made the bad decisions on, on going dirty. And, and I think that we have, we have to look at each officer's situation on their own before we start calling them corrupt and, and dirty and scumbags. You know, I think we need to look at what's, what's going on surrounding yeah, let's understand. Anyway, let's understand the culture. Let's understand the moral injuries that they're acquiring. Let's let's put that all together. Because if we understood it, we might be able to prevent a few of them. Exactly. Yeah. And um, you know, and this go this goes on today. I mean, I, I hear every once in a while a podcast where where they're calling me a scumbag and all that, and I, I get it. And I would have done the same thing back in the day. Sure. But until you walk in my shoes, well, you know, let, let's talk first. And then if you still think I'm a scumbag, well, then that's, that's your opinion. And that's okay. <laughs> right. But, so, so anyway, what, what had happened to, to Ruben Palomars was that he, he was sitting in, uh, I think it was San Bernardino County Jail. And he was just, he was going crazy, right? He was, he was trying to figure out ways to commit suicide and everything. 
And then God put a hell's angel in his cell, right? And I mean, this would never happen. I don't think today <laughs> where right. they, they put a hell's angel in my cell, you know, because just because of who I was. Right, right. And who he was. But I, I don't know if the guards were trying to mess with them or what, but this hell's angel brought him to the Lord, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. So he started meeting with pastors and stuff, and pastors came in and basically were healing him of his PTSD, right? So this was God again or, ordaining our meeting, putting us together here in Fort Worth because he said, listen, I can help you on that healing process, right? Because even in Texas, I was going to a psychologist every, every week. Of course, their psychologists there are interns. They're not real psychologists. Right, right. And, and one of the worst things, too, is, is this is just a side note, but when a cop goes to a psychologist who has no life experience and you say to them that I came to this accident scene and the head was lying there on the ground next to the car and there's blood bubbling out of the neck and they, they have this look of shock on their face like, oh my God, it, that doesn't help in the psycho psychological no, no. process. Yeah. You know, And that makes you want to shut up. That makes you not want to talk. And this is why I believe that it's so important to have cops that that become psychologists that that come counselors that have been there and done that 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 know what cops and firemen i keep saying cops but i do mean the whole first responder culture what right. they go through in order to, to get them to heal because that wasn't really good for me but anyway he starts teaching me the bible and, and how to look at the bible from a different perspective like i was looking at to read the bible but no there's all there's healing nuggets and there's there's ways to to live life God tells us how to live life through the Bible. Yeah. And I started opening my heart up and, and really studying. And we were, we were able, when working together, opening up, talking about our stuff, uh, praying, praying and repenting and all that. After four months with him, I have not had a PTSD-related symptom since then. I have not. And yeah. that's been 10 years now. No nightmares, no anxiety or panic attacks. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been incredible. And that's why I wrote this book. I wrote this book because healing is there if you really want it. But it is a, it's a lot of work to be done, right? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're so, so damaged. But so I believe, really, I believe God put, put me in touch with him. And then when I got under 10 years, um, they bring you to a, a minimum security prison. So I went to Lompoc, which is down by Santa Barbara. This was great because there's no fences, there's no walls, there's no locked doors. It's basically a, a camp where they trust you. So we had jobs. I worked in the chapel again. And I took over the chapel. And we, I, I did the sermons there. We put on classes and stuff like that. So that was a whole big, huge learning experience for me. I got my, my um, degree in drug counseling, and I got my doctorate degree in Christian counseling there too. So the whole time that God was preparing me, right, to come out and to do something. Yeah, And then um, what I forgot to mention is God, God ended up healing my, my daughter. She never had to go through the surgery. Oh, wow. Um, about six months later, they, they did other scans after lots of prayer and stuff. And the doctor to this day does not know how, how she healed, but there's, she has a clean liver. That's amazing. Now. So I, I believe God really moved by. He healed her, healed me. Yeah. And we started bringing more, more and more guys in and teaching them, you know, what the Bible says and, but some of those guys were healed too. So um, I yeah. do believe there's healing through the Christian method. Not that there isn't through the through a secular way, but but you found it. You found it through Christianity. I, I found it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Did Did your marriage survive incarceration? Yes. yes. Really? It, it, because well, because my wife knew who I was, right? Because she she got involved with me in 1996. Okay. So she knew who I was before my disease came on and before the pills came into the picture. She knew what kind of person I was hmm. and she knew my heart. And she told me and it already way in 2004, I was arrested in 10, I think it was, no, 11. But she told me in 2004, you've got chronic depression. You have got to go see somebody. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, you know, the regular cop in me, come on. You know, if you would just cook for me and have more sex with me, er everything would be fine, right? right, Blame, right. We're rolling yeah. the pages and, and turning it on her, you know? And, and I hurt her really bad by, by doing that. She knew she knew what I, I was going through. Although as a regular cop, you don't tell your family what you see every day, you sure. know? And I think that's a huge mistake that we're making. Not that we have to give graphic detail, but to give them an idea of what we're going through, you know? And I saw this today, honey. I, I, I need... 
I, I need a half hour just to kind of un- unwind a little bit. And then I'd love to talk to you about it because I believe that when we talk about it, 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 it makes us process that, that event to where it'll have less and less power over us in the future. Sure. What impact did your religious transformation <clears throat> have on your wife and your other family members? Like I said, I, I believe I was an atheist. And then, so I, ba- I bail out of jail and I'm sitting at home. And of course, I am just, uh, I'm a basket case. I don't know what's going to happen. I really believe that I'm going to be killed in prison. And, and this is just it. And I don't know what to do. So the phone rings. I go answer it. And, and the guy on the phone goes, hi, my name is Pastor Jeff. I'm a, I'm a pastor at a, at a church here, New Hope International. And I'm a a friend of a friend of your father's, he told me what was going on, and I just want to invite you to our church. And we have counseling and stuff that, that oh, wow. we can provide. And inside of me, I didn't say this, but inside of me, I'm going, who the hell is this guy? You know, <laughs> come on, just, just get right. off the phone. You know, he goes, well, I'd like to invite you to church. Uh, you know, maybe. Thank you. You know, I, I appreciate your call, but uh, I'm good. I'm right, good. right. But then here's the thing is he... In the middle of the call, he goes, okay, but before I hang up, can I pray with you? And I said, okay, sure. You know, in, in my mind, I'm like, knock yourself out. Do whatever you want. I right, right, you know? right. I mean, but my mom taught me to be nice. Right. So he, he prays the sinner's prayer, and I got no idea what the sinner's prayer is. And he, he prays it, and then at the end, he says, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I didn't really, I, I, I just wanted to be polite, so I said yes, you know. And he goes, okay, well, my invitation is always open, you know, uh, please stop by. So I hang up, I, I go back and sit on the couch where my wife is, and she's been a, a Catholic all her life, but because of my strong views, because back then, when, when you see these horrific things, you see these, the, the victimization of children, the victimization yeah. of the elderly, how can you truly believe there's a God that allows this, right? Sure, But that's, sure. just, that's just not knowing who God really is, you right. know, and now right. that I understand who God is, I, I kind of get that. So she, she says to me, what's wrong? And I go, well, nothing's wrong. Why? And she says, well, you, you kind of look a little bit different, like a different aura. I thought she was picking up on an aura. I, I really don't know what it exactly was. But <laughs> I said, I, you know, I do feel a little bit better, almost like a weight's been lifted off my shoulder. She goes, well, you know, maybe what we've been missing our, our, whole, our whole life here is, is God. Oh, and wow. I thought about it for a minute. I said, okay, well, why don't we go to church? So it was so funny. I dressed up because I always think, you know, church, you got to dress up. But, you know, I didn't know. I go, we go to this church on, on the next Sunday and this church was truly, a, 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 a like a missionary type church, right? Huh. It got guys with that tattooed up faces. They had shorts on, they had their hat right, on sideways. Right. You could tell that, you know, <laughs> spider webs on their elbows. You could tell that these were dudes from prison and I still got that judgment. Right. So I'm thinking to myself, God, I, I gotta get out of here. Well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna leave? But they all hugged us. They all came welcome. You yeah. know, can we help you get a seat? Do, do you need a bottle of water? They didn't know who I was, right? Yeah. The, the, the love and the welcoming was so overwhelming, something I was not getting from any of my police friends who I thought, we, we're going to go through thick and thin, right? You know, if, if, if you get shot at, I'm, I'm going to jump in front of the bullet for you. Sure. You know, and where were they? Yeah. Not one, yeah. not one. Well, I'm sorry, there was one. One. So not two. And... It, it was really weird for me. And, and the sermons were uplifting. The sermons felt like they came right at me. I truly believe there is a kind, loving, merciful God. Yeah. And I believe that he has a plan and a purpose for each of us, no matter what we've done. You know, yeah. we can be murderers, we can be gangsters, you know, you know uh, corrupt cops, we could be anything. But he has a plan and purpose for us. Wow. He's protected me. I mean, there were some guys that, that wanted to do me harm, but eventually they didn't. You know, and um, I I made it through. COVID happened. COVID was a horrible, horrible thing. But for me, it was a blessing because they let me out early because of it. So now uh, I'm back. I'm working as a as a drug addiction counselor in a men's residential facility. I'm working as a chaplain here um, in the city for uh, marketplace chaplains. And I'm just looking forward to, to doing small groups with the church and, and um, promoting this book, too. So, And I haven't read your book yet. I, I typically, if I interview somebody that's got a book, I try to read it first. And I haven't even purchased <laughs> your book yet. I, I saw it looked like a beast of a book. Unfortunately, it is. But yeah. it's, it's like comprehensive. It's more like for counselors. Yeah, well, almost to, like a to, to, manual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for, for me, it was, 
you have to understand who Jesus is before you can truly believe in him, right? Yeah, yeah. And you have, yeah. You have to believe that the Bible is true. So I got uh, a whole chapter of just a Bible study, why we should believe the Bible, why we should yeah. believe Jesus, yeah. and why his sacrifice. You know, because well, I look forward I, to it. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I had a hard time believing all this, but now when I read the scriptures and I know the, because, you know, in the theology courses, boy, they, they hammer history and all that stuff into you. So I explain that in, in simple terms that anybody can understand. And then I, I detail out the emotions, you know, the emotion of fear, yes. the emotion of anger. So everybody understands why we, we have anger. You know, so yeah, it, it is big. My, my publisher said, let's put it in two books. But if you only buy one of the books, I, I don't think it, it's yeah. you're not fully getting the, all the information, and then they're going to say, "Ah, oh, see, you know, God doesn't heal me." Oh. Right, so. right. So I'm actually going to be in the Bay Area here next month. I wish I had time to visit you. I, I don't. Oh, yeah, I, cool. I'm I'm pretty pretty booked. I'm flying. I had to fly into Oakland because it was cheaper, and then. Mm-hmm. I was going to visit another friend in San Francisco and he's like, oh, I'm teaching that day. And I'm like, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know if I feel safe parking in San Francisco. And so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so it turned out we made uh, plans for dinner with friends in San Jose. So we're, we're just awesome. going to like, just going to skip right through town. Uh, but awesome. my wife's never been out there before. And so this is her first uh-huh. trip. And, and so I was like, man, I want to go visit all these people I know. And, and <laughs> we, it, there's just not enough hours in the day, but, uh, yeah. but when I go, yeah. I'll be, I'll be thinking about, you and, uh, uh, thank and be, you. be praying for you too. Thank you. All right. One more question. During your time, did you have a, I, don't, I presume you probably had chaplains in your department, but did you have a chaplain that you knew on a first name basis? Did you have a relationship with any chaplains at that time? No, I didn't even know at that time there were police chaplains. Mm, I didn't know what really? was PTSD. I never knew, you know, no, they never told me in the police academy there's PTSD. In the yeah. academy, they had a three hour block on stress, right? Right, and exercise, right. exercise, and eat right. That was it. Right. So I, I believe that that's a good, good point. Is I believe that if we have chaplains, and I believe the city that I used to work at now does have chaplains. Okay. Um, but I, I think that is one of the the best things, and especially if that chaplain, you could trust that chaplain to be confidential. Mm. I, I think that would be the greatest thing. I mean, I would love to be a, a police ch- or a fire chaplain, but. You know, right now they're not even acknowledging I exist. So, but, <laughs> well, but, I think know, it's even even without what you went through. I think it's hard for law enforcement who are retired that want to be chaplains. I think it's hard for them to go back to their own department. There yeah. needs to be a bit of a gap there, and even then, you might have a reputation. And yeah. honestly, yeah. after you leave law enforcement, you change, you grow, you you evolve. Right. You, you're a different person. And you'll be judged for who you were 20 years ago. And so I, yeah. I, I recommend for a lot of police chaplains to go to a different department, go to a different yeah. agency. And so that, that's maybe a better better route for them. If they want to help, they just can't quite help in the exact same place where they worked. But yeah. yeah. Well, that's, well, that's a real good point. Norm, thank you so much. Th- this is fantastic. And thank you for you know sharing your your pain and your suffering and you know the catharsis you went through. Uh, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for providing me a forum. You know, it, the only reason I, I want to do these is that if anybody sees themselves in any of yes. those places that yes. I was, don't go down the same route I did. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to. And especially the suicide route. And thank you for allowing me to share. If, if one person is helped by this, and I'm going to put it out there that I know you're going to give my website out. If anybody is hurting and, and doesn't feel comfortable talking to anybody in their circle, please email me and, and we'll, we'll talk and I'm not going to put Christ, push Christianity on anybody. You know, we, we can just talk as, as, as two guys, one that's been through the crap and, yeah. and one that maybe just about to go through it because I truly don't want anybody to have to go through what I went through. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Norm. Thank you. I'm so thankful to Norm for sharing his story, especially his willingness to talk about the spiritual component of it. Talking about your own faith in a law enforcement environment can be difficult, especially if you've already established yourself as someone of no faith. It's also easy to be dismissed because of criminals who will hide behind faith and use it to manipulate others. Knowing all of this, Norm has decided that helping others outweighs the negative criticism he's likely to receive. Unlike a lot of supposed converts who never show any substantial fruit of repentance, any real change that produces results, Norm is the real deal. 
I don't know if that will repair all of the old wounds that he's caused. It probably won't get them all. But I'm thankful that Norm Welsh has a future as someone being used by God to help others. Please check out his book's website in the show notes. On the next episode of Hey Chaplain. You were having all this great opportunity. What what wall did you hit? The wall is the advancement of my career. I was a patrolman. I was a detective for a year, but it was a rotational thing. I tried to get back in, but um, that was a little competitive. Other guys wanted to do the same thing. I mean, with a small department, you've only got so many jobs that you can fill. I think they had like three detectives. So everybody's wanting to do those jobs. Right. So sometimes you're coming up against some very qualified people who have just as much experience and education as I have, and sometimes a little bit more, and are better suited for that job. So because you have a limited amount of opportunities, I mean, you're going to fall short sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. it definitely bottlenecks. An agency that small bottlenecks when it comes to promotions. Yeah. So it finally got to a point where I had enough time on the department to test for sergeant. So I studied really hard. I, you know, really hit the books. I mean, they give you training material, or they give you reading material to look at, and things that you should know. You learn all the laws and stuff like that. So I tested for sergeant, made number three on the list. Well, here in KCK, you make number three on the list, you're guaranteed. Oh, yeah. You're going to yeah, be you'll be promoted almost immediately. So that was a two-year list. I made number three on the list, and they only promoted one person. The views expressed here are the personal views of the hosts and our guests and do not necessarily represent the views of any law enforcement agency or its components. If you liked what you heard here, please share this episode with a cop or someone who loves a cop. Thank you for listening today. And as always, pray for peace in our city.